the gate reaches. Oh, that ball's out. That's live. Back the other way. Sam Hubbard. The Cincinnati kid. Hubbard's got a convoy. Chased by Andrews. At the 30. The 20. He will score. To the end zone. Down the field. And it is deflected. And gone. Touchdown. The throw, men are coming late. Look right down the middle. There is Eddie Brown. He has it at the 35 to the 30. He may go. 10 5. Touchdown. Now the Bengals' Super Bowl chances rest on his right foot. The kick is up. Yeah. It yeah. is good. Corey Dillon, he's gone. The knockout punch. You're looking at it. 65 yards. And they're back to throw as the blitz is on. Goes long and tended for Collinsworth. He has the down of the funny touchdown. And Chris Collinsworth. Throwing the long ball. Deep down the field. Oh, Chad Jones, it's coming. Touchdown, Cincinnati. Look at Chase go. Oh, my goodness. What a gear he just found. Chase for the touchdown. Chase is on the case. It is no fluke. It is a fact. The Cincinnati Bengals are headed to Super Bowl 56. The play clock at three. Shotgun snap. Car throws nice. into traffic. Nice. Intercepted. Nice. Nice. Jermaine Pratt Woo, has baby. the football. Yeah. Coffin nails. Bam, bam, bam. How about that? Heartbreak in Baltimore. Bengals fall to four and six on the season. Craig Sandlin in here to join me for the postgame show as we wrap up Thursday night football. Craig, there for a while, I thought this was setting up to be one of the best postgame shows we've ever had the pleasure of doing together. Not the case. Absolute heartbreak. This might be the lowest I've been yet this year, and that's saying a lot. Because after that first Ravens loss, I said that it was one of the worst regular season losses, if not the worst regular season loss, that I've experienced. But uh, this one's certainly up there as well. Heartbreak continues to mount in the 2024 Bengals season. I got to see your reaction there through most of the last bit of the game. It was helped, helped to keep me ha have some life there as it, as it fell through our fingers. But man, we have some great players on this team. Some players that are, are towards the top of the league in their position, no doubt about it, but unable to capitalize on historic performances yet again. Craig, I think you're muted. Let's try this again. There we go. Jacob, I'm not going to lie to you. After that first half, I was ready to join this live stream and tell you that I was all the way back in. There we go. I was loving what I was seeing out of the defense. I was okay with what I was seeing out of the offense. I was getting excited, not going to lie. And yeah. As the game went on and the defense struggled, I said, you know what? That's okay. We don't expect this defense to be great. We don't expect them to shut down, but the offense can keep doing what they do. And if this team is for real, they can find a way to win this game despite yep. the defense in the second half. And quite frankly, they they did. I mean, if you if you consider the the non -call, called holding there on the two point conversion which would have given them another chance from the one yard line where yep. I know we've been, we've been rough in short yardage this year, but I like our chances on, on a two point conversion from the one. I thought, I thought we had a chance really to, to pull this one out. Um, like you said, disappointing. Um, melancholy for sure. Yeah. A lot of words to describe this feeling. Um, this isn't the like feeling that I expected here. No, but I thought even if we lost, it was going to be 
a way that I could work around, but blowing a 14 point lead like that, getting the generational performances from Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase. And I gave them their own piece of the ticker here. We'll get to it for sure. Because I mean, that was incredible, but I think we got to get some of the, some of the negativity out first, because it wouldn't feel right to just jump into talking about some good stuff off, off the rip and and man, to continue to see these numbers put up by these guys on offense and, and not be able to capitalize These examples are mounting of just phenomenal, phenomenal games by the offense, and you haven't been able to pull it through. And honestly, in this game, I don't know how much I blame the defense. Would I have loved more out of them? Absolutely. 35 points. Unacceptable. I get that. How did the Ravens score today? A turnover on downs gave them a short field. I mean, you you continued to – a fumble gave them a short field. You continued to give them opportunities – with shorter fields, I know they weren't necessarily 20 or 30 yard fields. The fumble was, but the turnover on downs were, were towards the other side of the 50. But still, when you give Lamar Jackson and that Ravens offense, who's the best in the NFL to this point, opportunities to inch their way back into the game, they're going to seize it. Those kind of mistakes, this is exactly what Joe Burrow was talking about throughout the week. The mistakes they made against the Raiders and won that game, they were able to do because it was the Raiders. You turn the page this week, you play the Ravens, you cannot make all those mistakes. Everyone in our chat, certified ball knowers, as soon as we were up 14 points, all anyone said was play a mistake-free game the rest of the way. No turnovers, no missed tackles, no blown coverages, no wide-open receivers. For the next 30 minutes of football, it was nothing but mistakes. I don't know how the team can look so different in two halves, and it's been something that's happened a lot this year. Well, I, um, I mean, I think you have to go back to momentum killers. And we saw the same thing with the Eagles game. The Bengals and Eagles were playing a back and forth game. Yep. And then you have a fourth down that you fail to convert. And from there, the game gets away from you. And luckily, the Bengals were able to rebound a little bit on this one. But that Chase Brown fumble at the beginning of the second half. Yeah was a momentum killer. You come out of this of the halftime, you get the, the Ravens to punt on a three and out where they gain two yards, and you come out and you hit Jamar Chase for a 67-yard touchdown on the first play of your next drive after we're talking about run the ball and let's have a long, nice drive here. They go out and they hit Jamar Chase for 67 yards. Well, you get the Ravens to punt again on the next drive, and now you're looking at 21-7 to with the ball in your possession with um, with under 10 minutes to go in the third quarter with a chance to really put the Ravens away at that point. Yep. And instead, you fumble the ball away. The Ravens are able to score on a five-play, 31-yard drive. You punt on the next play on a, again, d- we'll talk about it, debatable decision to punt the ball in that scenario where you had the ball in the Baltimore 40, whether you punt the ball there or kick a 58-yarder is debatable. We'll talk about that. Baltimore pl- scores on missed tackle touchdown uh, to Tylen Wallace. And then you turn the ball over on downs again in a scenario where, again, you have the ball on the Baltimore 34-yard line. You have an opportunity to kick a field goal, take a, take a expend your lead to, to four. You don't do that. You give up another Baltimore touchdown. And, and at that point, Baltimore's got a 28-21 to 21 lead, and it just different – makeup of a game now the Bengals responded and they were able to score that 70 yard touchdown to Jamar Chase after that but that made it 28 to 28 instead of a game where you should have already been up 28 to 7 or it the bare minimum 21 to 7 with the Ravens and deep in their own territory and instead you're fumbling it away and it just changes the complete outcome of the game again and it just feels like this this team right now has these momentum killers that really are the difference in these really competitive games against good teams and good teams don't kill themselves and that's what's been killing the Bengals right now is themselves it feels like exactly what you just said every single loss the Bengals have had this season the main culprit is the Bengals it's every single every single one you can point to one key play where you lose momentum and it's really none of them is it a point where it's forced by the other team? It's self-forced errors. And in the case tonight, it's Chase Brown getting into the pile, fighting for extra yards, picks up about nine uh, on a trying to fight for an extra one or two to get the first down, and he doesn't put the second hand on the ball. It's just 
basic stuff like that. I mean, you look back at the Chiefs game. I know we're going all the way back to week two, but the Joe Burrow fumble, scoop, and score. Yeah, that changed everything in that game. An opportunity where the the Bengals had to to really put a stranglehold on the Chiefs in that one, and you give them the ball back and put them right back in the game. You can go down the line, the, the muffed kick or the, the muffed hold on the field goal attempt against Baltimore. Every single loss the Bengals had this season, there is one point, some later in the game than others, but there's one point where the momentum switched and the Bengals were unable to get it back. And I, I don't know whether that falls on the players or the coaches, but I think that's a team culture issue if you cannot turn the page. You have to have short memories in sports, and it seems like the Bengals are elephants out there not forgetting a single thing. As soon as one mistake is made, it seems like it just compounds across the entire offense. And I'm not even necessarily talking about the big ones like the fumbles. Early in the game, Cody Ford gets beat on a pass rush. The rest of the game, it doesn't seem like he really locked in and, and turned the page and won much at all. Joe Burrow was running for his life all day long, and it wasn't just Ford. The interior struggled mightily, and, and Marius Mims got beat once or twice. So, I, I'm not just picking on one guy, but it felt like as soon as the Ravens proved that they could beat that offensive line early in the game, the offensive line said, well, we'll give it our best, but this is going to be a tough one. Joe's going to have to save us, and, and, it, and that's kind of the sentiment that seems to ripple throughout the entire team. As soon as Chase Brown fumbles there, the defense it basically gives up a touchdown and I don't necessarily fault them for that because it was the short field but never bouncing back and crumbling the rest of the game what do we say after that they've only let them score on short fields well after that fumble what happened Bengals punted away and the Ravens go 92 yards the defense completely disappeared after that momentum shift and that's just not something that hap that can happen if the offense wants to have that issue about remembering mistakes I, I guess we can have that debate when it comes that can't seep to the other side of the ball you can't have that happen. These have to be two units that operate to the best of their ability independently and they come together to form a really good football team. That's not the case right now. When one side fails, it seems to ripple throughout the entire team, and I don't understand why. We can keep putting it on Zach Taylor and these coordinators, but at some point these players are their own men. They're professional athletes. They have to be able to operate on this on their own. And that's not the only grade school mistakes we made tonight. How many angles on wide open plays? I'll, I'll pick on the Tylen Wallace touchdown because it's the one on the forefront of my mind. I'm sure we'll have better, more intricate film on Tuesday. But on that play, Cam Taylor Britt misses an open field tackled, which he's done all year long. This isn't some kind of curveball that Cam Taylor Britt's missing a tackle. And the entire defense thinks he's just going to no doubt bring him down. Logan Wilson and Geno Stone slow up and then can't get to Tylen Wallace on the sideline and he goes 86 yards for a touchdown. Unacceptable. They tucked their tail and they hid today in the second half. And I, I, it's incredibly frustrating. There's a lot of things that are frustrating. I mean, I'm looking at the initial PFF grades here after this game and like Joe Burrow hurried 26 times. 26 Hurries. He got hit 11 times tonight, Jacob. Like, I, I I realize that it takes two to tango. I realize that you're in the position you're in due to injuries. But at the end of the day, this offensive line has major, major flaws that we have known yep. really since day one. The fact that we went into the season with – a scenario where we knew Cody Ford was going to be the first man off the bench. Just not a good scenario. And it comes down to the front office, putting these all. guys in a good position. And, and, and that obviously didn't work out. You know, you mentioned specifically <clears throat> Cody Ford, excuse me. Um, but if we're, if we're being honest, I mean, nobody, Alex Kappa, we talked about him, unfortunately on, on Tuesday, mm -hmm. He has an initial PFF grade on pass blocking uh, sets of a 28.9. Amarius Sounds Mims, right. 39.6. Like Cordell Volson, 54.5. Cody Ford, 56.6. With the exception of Ted Karras, all four of your offensive linemen have a su sub-60 pass blocking grade. Yeah. It's just not going to get the job done. And uh, and it's just putting Burrow in a, in a predicament where, you know, we see that, you know, he takes a cheap shot late um that was unflagged that that may or may not have injured him and you know he was able to continue to play but you know that kind of stuff adds up 
And I felt like Joe had happy feet, especially in the first half. I felt yeah. like he was leaving the pocket a little early. He wasn't really controlling the pocket in a way that I feel like Joe Burrow can. Um, and then on the defense, like you mentioned, it just compiled. I mean, the, the, the team was tackling really well in the first half. They were really containing the, the Baltimore attack. And uh, in the second half, it just kind of fell apart, and, and it really came down to tackling. I mean, if, it, if, if you don't let Tylen Wallace get free for that long touchdown, I mean, we may be talking a different story, but right. it just, you know, it's just a compounding uh, issue, and it just kind of spreads throughout the team, like you said, and um, just, you know, a really frustrating night, and, and I think you can tell by Jacob and, and Ida's demeanor, like this isn't, this isn't really kind of the show we were expecting, at, you know, especially yeah. if you would have talked to us 15, 20 minutes ago uh, or an hour ago. Um, an 84 yard touchdown for Tylen Wallace with two missed tackles and two players giving up on the play. Longest passing just touchdown of Lamar's career. Enough. Yeah. Just not good enough. And, not um, you know, here we are. We're going to break down the film this week. We'll, we'll be back on, yep. you know, on Tuesday to, to kind of go through this. But, it just, you know, there's so many holes that that are that are really tough to figure out. And then the other side of me, Jacob, I'm just going to be honest. Like, yeah, the other half of me looks at this offense and I'm like, I don't care how bad the defense is. This offense is good enough to win games. Right. And I still don't think they're out of the playoff picture. Right. Which and is you guys crazy that on off the to bench say. this morning. But like, I really don't think they're out. Right. And it, like. So I, I I'm and just that's in the this thing I think why all of these losses, why all of these losses rip our heart out every single time, because we can sit here after the game and admit that it's not a good football team, and I've known that for weeks. But you still hear me every week come in here and say I'm bought in on this team in this season because the AFC is terrible. The AFC is horrendous. There are going to be multiple bad teams that make the playoffs, and of those bad teams, none of them are quarterbacked by Joe Burrow. And if we learned anything tonight, it doesn't matter how anyone's on the field plays. Joe Burrow is unbelievable. If he's not the best quarterback in the league, he's top two or three. He has been nothing but great this year. They're sitting at four and six, seven of nine, quickly became six of eight, or yeah, seven and nine. Now you got to win six of seven which is incredibly, incredibly tough. But the AFC, these standings, and this Bengals schedule, I just can't quit. I just cannot quit it. The Bengals lose this game. They fall to ninth in the AFC. Obviously, a lot of that can change as this week progresses and wins and losses shake out through the West rest of Week 10. But looking just at the teams above the, the Bengals right now, the wildcard Baltimore Ravens, obviously, we can comfortably say they're better. They swept us this year. After that, we'll see about the Chargers on Sunday Night Football. I think that'll be a fun one next week. Broncos, Colts, and Jets. I'll take the Bengals over all those teams. You cannot convince me the Bengals are eliminated from playoff contention. Winning today would have gone a long way in making me believe they could make a run in the playoffs because they've still yet to beat any good teams. But good news for the Bengals, there's not many good teams left on that schedule. So if you keep taking out if you keep taking out the trash, you're probably going to be able to sneak into the playoffs or at least be right there in that in the hunt graphic in week 15, 16, 17 and 18. And that's really what we're asking for after this start is be in the hunt, be in the mix. And sitting at 4 and 6, you have an uphill battle, but you still have the ability. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I I really hesitate to to say that they're out of the playoff picture. I mean, you know, you know me. I'm the I'm typically right, the right. the pessimist here. I'm the I'm the one who's who's down on everything. And yeah. the fact of the matter is still like the AFC is terrible. This offense is really, really good. And I you know, if this defense can just get some momentum and make some plays, then I feel like all it really takes is a couple stops a game. They don't have to shut people out. They don't have to score, you know, hold people to 17 points a game. But at some point, this defense has to get a big stop, and that doesn't feel like it really ever happens. Nope. Uh, you know, so you're sitting at four and six here. You go to LA, another primetime matchup before your bye week, and you've got an opportunity to pick up the W before the bye, get healthy, get right. You know, obviously, you hope that Orlando Brown is back for next week. He's got 10 days now uh, to get right. 
Um, buy after that, so it could make sense and to a hold buy him after out that. if he's not 100%, though. God, I sure hope we don't. Um, but would understand it. And it just, you know, you sit at four and six and you look at the schedule ahead and, you know, I fully admit that I, I still had this as like an L on the on the schedule as I was kind of going through the the scenarios. And even with this as an L on the on the on the schedule, they can still get to 10 wins or even nine wins might get in this year. So um, it's tough. But but then the question becomes, OK, let's say you get in and it's seemingly going to come down to to Kansas City or Baltimore. Well, Lamar Jackson's now 6 and 1 against Joe Burrow, Jacob. Yep. And and that's not because Joe Burrow has performed poorly. You know, I'd have to do some quick math based on how things went today, but Joe Burrow now in his 7 games against the Baltimore Ravens against Lamar Jackson has thrown for 2000 yards. Yeah. In those in those games 428 tonight he had 1531 coming in so he's at 1950 yards you know throws for four touchdowns tonight that puts him at 16 touchdowns and five interceptions in his career head-to-head against Lamar all of those clearly not his fault the difference is Lamar Jackson in those seven games he's now sitting at 1750 yards he's sitting at 16 touchdowns as well to only two interceptions you know plus lamar jackson's adding the the yards on the ground over 300 uh on the ground coming into today adds another 33 today 350 yards on the ground in those seven games i mean it's just you know it's it's uh it's frustrating that joe burrow can perform this well yeah and not be basically a shoe in for MVP conversations and Super right. Bowl contending every year because it feels like you are wasting Joe Burrow right now with the defense that you're trotting out here every year. And the problem is now you look ahead, let's say you're looking let's say that you have given up on this year and you right. look ahead to the draft. The the truth remains that there's still so many holes on this team. Yeah. And so many question marks on the offense, even with T. Higgins, Jamar Chase's contract scenario. I, I just don't have. I don't see how there's a fix coming in the near term for this defense, just no. based on the way this this front office has drafted and what they've prioritized. Winning these shootouts is it's the Bengals team we're going to watch for the next few years, at least. You just have to start winning. I mean, you can't lose games 34-35. We're going to be in a billion of these games a year. And if we get to a point where we're still Super Bowl contenders or get, I guess, stills the wrong word now. If we get back to the point where we're Super Bowl contenders, you're going to play more of these games in the playoffs because I don't think this defense is just going to magically be fixed. So you have to figure out a way to score more than the other team because in these shootouts, you've been scoring less than them. And that's not winning games. And that's the frustrating part. But Craig... We got to get to the point that I'm sure everyone's interested in talking about. Everyone that's staying up past midnight here wants to hear the, the, the talk about the play calls today. Obviously, the two big ones, two fourth down fades to Jermaine Burton. Third down play before that, a fade to Jamar Chase. A punt when you could have taken a 50-something yard field goal. Uh, you can tackle it first if you'd like. You can take them all. You can take half of them. I do think it's important that we split it up. And you talk about the process and then the play. Go, I think going for it yeah. and, and then what the play call is, it's important to have two separate conversations there. And then one I obviously forgot to mention, going for it, the two-point conversion instead of kicking the field goal at the end. Really, those four plays um, circled in the outcome of this yep. game. Let's, let's go through them in the order that they happened in the game, Jacob. We'll start early on in the game. The Bengals obviously score another phenomenal first drive for the Bengals in this game that's five straight games now that the Bengals have scored on their opening drive um, including the opening kickoff return the Baltimore Ravens then go three and out and punt the Bengals get the ball back at their own 10 and they progress down the field to the Baltimore 48 yard line where it's first and 10 at the 48 with about four minutes to go in the first quarter Chase Brown runs to the left for seven yards Second and three at the 41. Joe Burrow, incomplete pass to Andre Yoshivas. Third and three. 
Joe Burrow pass incomplete deep right to Mike Gusecki, third or fourth and three now at the 41 yard line. Now I was in the chat at this point, Jacob, saying that I would take the field goal and go yep. up two possessions early in this game. Let's just start with the decision to go for it on fourth and three with the ball at the Baltimore 41 in that situation. What's your thoughts there? Thoughts have to come down to whether or not this team believes in Evan McPherson. If you don't, if you're not confident he makes that kick, then you have to go for it because there's no point in punting that ball. I mean, I, I think if you extend that kicker, you have to have faith in him. Why do we, why do after a couple misses, one of which was because of a bad hold, we just no longer let Evan McPherson kick anymore? I certainly would have taken the, ex, the, the field goal and the extra three points and gone up 10. No question about it in my mind. Otherwise, you need to cut Evan McPherson. Because if you're never going to trot him out there for a 50-yard kick, go get another kicker. There's no point in having him take up a roster spot if you have no faith in him. I think that was the perfect time to kick it. Yeah, well, you know, there's a lot of, of question marks around Evan McPherson right now, it seems, and I understand that, you know, he hasn't been the same uh, over the last two years, really, um, especially from 50-plus. But at the same time, you're paying this guy over $6 million a year to be your kicker, and it's not necessarily a high-pressure kick in that scenario. You know, it's early in the game. Yes, it's a 58-yarder. Yes, it's a terrible field. But the truth of the matter is, is that you've got an opportunity to go up 10 points early on against the Baltimore Ravens, a division rival. I, I didn't love going for it to begin with. All right, we'll start there. Uh, sounds like sounds like maybe we're on the same page there. I would have taken the points, gone up 10 to nothing early. Now you decide to go for it, fourth and three. I want to start by saying, You've got Chase Brown that picks up seven yards on first down and you don't run the ball again and give it back to him to try and pick up another first down at any point during that that possession there, right? So that part is frustrating for me. Yeah. The part that's going to be really frustrating, and I'm going to have to go back and watch tape, and I think we're going to have to watch tape on all of these fourth down attempts. No question um, about that. And, and some of these decisions is what what was the read? What was there on the field? What were the other receivers running? Was anybody open? Exactly. I don't love, you know, you know I got to try and re remember and keep them all straight. I don't love that Burton seemed to be read one on that play. Right. It's right. not like Burrow was looking elsewhere. Burrow must have had some sort of pre-snap read that made him believe that that Jermaine Burton was going to be his go-to play on that on that route. Mm -hmm. And then he overthrew him by five yards, right? right? And that was seemingly a consistent story this game that I think has to be talked talked on too. Is that Joe Burrow and Jermaine Burton on deep routes did not seem aligned? I don't love a deep shot there. Um, I'm gonna reserve complete judgment until I see tape, um, but. The truth of the matter is that he overthrew him by five yards, and it just feels like a wasted play at that point. 100%. 100%. And that wasn't the only time Burrow overthrew a deep ball on fourth down. But, um, yeah, if you're going to throw that ball to Jermaine Burton, my initial thought and the thought of a lot of guys in the chat just from the TV angle, which was cleared up after we, we saw some different angles and some conversation from people that were in the stadium or on the sideline, was that Jermaine Burton slowed up on that route. It certainly looked like he was re-accelerating, I guess, when the camera cut to him at the end of that route. A lot of people were saying that that was not the case after they saw different angles, so important to note that. But um, very unfortunate for Burrow, especially if that was the first read because uh, he, he did truly have such a remarkable game today. And uh, that was a ball that seemed like it was, op it was open. Burton had, had the steps. If that throws better, it could have been six, much less the conversion. So... I, I might just be a rookie who hasn't even been at practice every day. That doesn't know, know where he's supposed to be at the end of these routes and wasn't tracking the ball well. I, I don't know what the situation was there. If he was the first read, that's an issue in and of itself. You have plenty of other people on this team that I would go to before that guy. It was proven to not be reliable this year. And in a moment of need there on fourth down early in the game with a chance to take a big-time lead, you, you, you throw a deep ball to him. It lands about five five yards outside of his reach. It's just... 
And that's the first action we saw from him today. It was, it, it was kind of like that would have been a great start to the day for both Burton and, and the Bengals' offense to, to dig Baltimore into that deeper hole by connecting on that play for the touchdown, take a 14 nothing lead, but obviously not what happened. Yeah, absolutely. Let's fast forward, Jacob, to the third quarter. After the Chase Brown fumble, the Baltimore Ravens score – on a five play 31 drive touchdown drive to make the score 21 to 14. Mm-hmm. The Bengals take over at the 19 after a terrible return by Jermaine Burton. Um, they do pick up a couple chunks. They get a 15 yard completion to Jamar Chase. They get another 17 yard completion to Jamar Chase that takes them down to the Baltimore 34 yard line. Yep. But then Joe Burrow is sacked by Justin Matabike uh, to make it second and 16 at the Baltimore 40. Uh, Burrow then incomplete. Uh, Burrow takes a shot down the middle to Jamar Chase, also incomplete. Uh, Brings up fourth and 16 at the Baltimore 40. Uh, Would have been a 57 or so yard field goal at that point. Um, You were were on the record during the show that you agreed with punting in that scenario, and you were pretty confident in that. Yes. Um, I'm... Still, still of this mindset that we have to have and faith in our kicker. And I think one of the challenges that we're having here, and, and this is one of my fears if I'm Zach Taylor, is that I am deliberately telling Evan McPherson right now that I don't trust you. And That's whether you do or not, he now knows you don't. And so for me, again, understand the the decision to punt it and to to punt, you know put them in their own uh to deep in their own territory but i think i would have gone for the points there again try to get a two possession lead over a baltimore team that just scored on a on a touchdown i i think that from a momentum play i think i'm trying to get points on the board there I, I don't I don't hate the take. I, I felt pretty strongly about it during the game that the punt was the right move, but hindsight's obviously always twenty twenty, and, and getting the points there would have been huge for the Bengals with this with this final outcome. But a couple of things I, I want to kind of focus on, on on the periphery of the decision to punt this away. Before that punt, the Ravens' touchdowns were a 30-yard drive following the fumble and a 55-yard drive following a turnover on downs. The defense had forced three, three, two three and outs and then a six-play drive that resulted in a punt for the Ravens. Every time the Ravens were backed up with even a reasonably long field, the defense had gotten a stop. And this put them at 93 yards to have to score a touchdown. And they only scored it because the defense gave up on a Tylen Wallace play where he ran down the sideline for 86 yards. I- Pause. They, they, they scored in that play because of right. that. I'm not, I'm not I'm saying not they wouldn't say they have scored. Only That's scored fair. because of that. That's definitely fair. But I, you can't yes, say they wouldn't have they scored. They certainly scored quicker on a more explosive play than, but than maybe they would. The defense still didn't give up a 93-yard like drive. Like They didn't get drove down the field. It was one bad play. I, I still think I stand with that punt there. It, it's a tough pill to swallow in a one-point loss, but your defense had been playing really well up to that point. If you truly don't trust your kicker, which we already saw earlier in the game, I think it's a questionable decision to walk him out there for a 58-yard kick when you declined it earlier. It's just mixed messages there. I, I don't hate punting that ball. I, I think the defense just gave up on a play where they could have got a stop, and who knows what happens after that. So I think even hindsight-wise, looking back at that one, I'm, I'm fine I'm fine co-signing that punt. I know a lot of people won't be. Yeah, I'm again, I, Ryan Rico has shown – inability to be a a very good punter and i i understand you know let's pin them deep and he did exactly what he was supposed to do um and you know i think i think again like you said hindsight's 2020 and you know the the defensive outcome may be you know kind of blinding a little bit there in terms of what people thought uh could have been done um i just don't i'm going back to the same point over and over again and i I don't think we need to hammer this home but i don't love the mindset that we are likely putting evan mcpherson in right now 100 percent. and 
for a guy who has been clutch, for a guy who has been able to kick long field goals in big moments, at some point you have to give him something beyond 40 yards. And I'm sure I'm misremembering. It feels like it's been three or four games since he's had a a shot outside of like 45 yards. Everything feels like it's been short for him and everything else has been either going for it or, or, um, or punt it away. So I, I just worry a little bit that when you're going to need him, he's not going to be ready in the way that you would like him to be ready because you haven't used him in these other situations. Now, yeah, you punt it, the Ravens take advantage. They get the Tylen Wallace, uh, 84 yard touchdown from mm-hmm. Lamar Jackson on the missed tackle. Justin Tucker misses the extra point. It stays 21 to 20 in that, in that moment. Bengals get the ball after the touchback. Another chunk play for Jamar Chase. He picks up 17 yards on the first play of the drive. Um, takes you to your, uh, to your 47. And then Chase Brown picks up four to get you into Baltimore territory. You pick up seven more from Chase Brown to make it first and 10. Uh, you get Mike Gesicki for a five yard catch to make it second and five at the Baltimore 37, uh, chase Brown catches a ball for three yards to make it third and two. And then this is where I, I just don't understand the back-to-back play calls third and two at the Baltimore 34 Joe Burrow pass incomplete deep right to Jamar chase. And then on fourth and two. Yet again, Joe Burrow pass deep down the left sideline to Jermaine Burton is yet again overthrown. This ball, again, the Baltimore 34-yard line, Jacob. Yep. Fourth and two. I think we I think you actually may have said it on the the broadcast, but once they threw that deep shot on third and two, you know they were going for it on fourth and two. Correct. To follow that up. Let me actually, I'm going to stop because we said we were going to leave it at decisions first and then play calls third and two. You take a deep shot to Jamar chase. I don't think we need to have a lot of conversation about this. Once you took that deep shot, I think it was pretty obvious what your plan was. You only take that deep shot if you're going to go for it. You only take the deep shot if you're going to go for it. But again, at that point you have a 21 to 20 lead didn't end up mattering, but 24 to 20 sounds a lot better as you you know, near the end of the game, mm-hmm. ten, that's with nine twenty nine left in the game at that point, Jacob. Yep. Fourth and two at the thirty four. I'll start with: Are you again going for it on fourth and two at the thirty four? I am, and the only reason I am is because I think at this point in the game you feel quite different about the defense than you did earlier in the game. I was okay with giving it back earlier in the game because the defense had proven that they could get stops. Going for this one, you have a chance to put it away, or at least it feels like you really do. And I think you have to take that. It's the same thing I'm going to get to when we come to the to the two-point conversion. It's You have a chance to end the football game. I think you have to try to take it. I feel 20, like... 24-20... What makes you think Lamar Jackson's not going to go score at that point? I mean, maybe he is, Jacob, but you have a four-point lead, and now a field goal ties it it's up three. if they, yeah, no, if I they know. do score a touchdown. Yeah. It's not about whether or not you're going to stop Lamar Jackson. It's about what's going to put you in a position in the future to be able to tie this game or win it. And being 24-20 to 20 is a lot different than being 20 20- one to 20 and then you give up that touchdown and the two-point conversion and now it's 28 21 instead of what could have been 28 to 24 or 27 to 24 because they probably don't go for two in that scenario so now it's 27 to 24 you kick a field goal to tie it rather than having to score a touchdown now again the Bengals scored the touchdowns that they needed at the end of the game so you know hindsight's 2020 but yeah, if you do that, I, I, yeah, I, mean, I guess you, just, you I guess you are you, right. You gotta think about all the scenarios, right? Yeah. I mean No, you're right. So that, yeah, that's so that's where I struggled with that decision. I, th- I think I'd care I about it less just because we were able to capitalize on touchdowns the rest of the way. 
if we weren't yeah, and it was coming down to on the board goals, there you, you're yeah you're def yeah no you're right yeah you're definitely right you win this game 37 to 35 instead of winning losing this game 35 to 34 yeah i mean i hate to say it like i again i know hindsight is 2020 and i realize that we don't know what baltimore would have done out of these situations but you're you're talking about giving Baltimore the ball in decent field position multiple times. You're talking about leaving nine points on the board multiple because of multiple decisions throughout the course of the game. And it just stacks and stacks and stacks. And I like Zach Taylor being aggressive in the right moments, but like that can't be your every, every go to for the entire game, every single game. And like it's one thing to talk about the the Philadelphia Eagles going for it on fourth and one every time because they know that they can do the tush push and pick up that yardage. That's a lot different than going for it on fourth and two, fourth and three with this team because they don't have that kind of stuff. They don't have a run game yeah. to pick up the two yards. They don't have a consistent deep threat to take the top off. Now, Jamar Chase obviously did that today, but in the past that hadn't happened. And so now you're in a situation, again, it just – I like being aggressive in, in the right moments, but you just left points on the board time and time again here. And for a fan base who wants to blame a lot on Zach Taylor and on Lou Anarumo, Zach Taylor's got to shoulder the fact that those are nine points that you left on the board. So even if you still give up the touchdowns afterwards, you're in a much different situation than you end up being at the end of the game. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And, uh, and that, brings us to the final play call of the day that I think we're going to discuss here and that's the two-point conversion at mm -hmm. the end and I'll go ahead and start here zero 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 thought in my mind to kick that extra point zero not even considering it didn't even cross my mind soon as they scored I was hoping they went for two do I love throwing the ball to Tanner Hudson no but we're not grading play calls right now we're we're grading the process, and I think going for two is absolutely, without a doubt, the right process. And I, I really don't know how it wouldn't be because if it's if you kick the extra point, you're virtually putting this game down to a coin flip. Lamar Jackson has scored every time he got the ball in the second half. He's been phenomenal in the second half. Lights out. Derrick Henry, what did he do last game when he went to overtime against the Ra against the Ravens? He bottled up all day, busts out a 60-yard run to push him over 100 yards at the end of the game. Ravens could field goal and win. You have to go to for two and end the football game. You don't give the ball back to Lamar Jackson. That was the right play by Zach Taylor to go for two there and try to end it. Yeah. So statistically, you are in a coin flip either way. You are either in a literal coin flip going into yeah. overtime, hoping that you win the coin flip and getting the ball, or you are in a play going for two that is statistically a coin flip. I think the success rate on two-point conversions is essentially 48% or something like that. Um, that essentially puts you in a coin flip scenario either way. And I, like you, would much rather that coin flip be coming out of my hands than coming out of a referee's hands or Lamar Jackson's hands. Ask and Bengals so, fans if they prefer to put their lives on the line of George Washington or Joe Burrow. I'm taking the human being quarterback, <laughs> not the quarter. It seems like a pretty easy yeah. choice to me. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think there's any scenario there. And if there's any Bengals fan who's legitimately arguing against this, I think they the only people that would be arguing against this are the old school. Yes. Like exactly. Like you know older fans who are not with it with analytics and you know the 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 fact of the matter is is that back in the 1990s a lot of teams would have just kicked that extra point and gone to overtime and if yep. and the other piece of this jacob is that if we if the nfl had college overtime rules i think your decision making might be different too a hundred percent no in that question scenario, you have the over the ball playoffs 100%. playoffs your decisions are different because you get the ball back yeah. correct so, you know, but in this scenario, I think you have to trust your best player with the ball in his hands, Joe Burrow. Again, I think Mike Gesicki was held on that play. I think that Tanner Hudson is probably not the best read there, but once Mike Gesicki is held, I don't know that what the next read was. Right. I don't know what everybody else on the play was looking like, but I do know that Mike Gesicki was held. Um, 
I liked them trying to draw Baltimore off sides uh, beforehand. Yeah, yeah, I love that. You uh, have timeout. You can't take taking it with the play you. call. Yep, yeah, take the timeout. Um, so in general, like that sequence felt like it went exactly like it should, um, with the exception of the ball going to to Tanner Hudson. But I think that you tip your cap to the Ravens on that one. I I don't know. I I, I think we're all on the same page here. That's a that's a scenario where you have to go for it. Um, I don't think there's much debate there. Um, it just didn't work out in your favor, and and now you're left with a terrible odds and an onside kick, and that didn't go your way either, and you're left with a 35 to 34 loss. That's right. Now I guess I mean it's not anywhere near the list of complaints today with this Bengals loss. But another thing that I'm friendly reminded about every time we get a close game down the line absolutely hate that you have to announce the onside kick i mean i know in that situation everyone in the stadium would know you're going for it anyway but the level of at least the the threat of surprise makes it fun i know you can't do it with the new setup but announcing it takes so much of the fun out of that play but uh, i digress it doesn't mean anything no one recovers them anyway craig we've been at it for a while it's been a lot of sadness let's try to smile a little bit let's try to smile a little bit i'll do it if you do it look at it i'm happy (laughs) Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase are generationally talented. That is the one thing we can take away from this game is we have a quarterback and we have a wide receiver who were at the top of their position groups in the entire league. Joe Burrow was tasked with throwing the football over 55 times today. Not many quarterbacks in the league have the trust of their coach to be asked to do that, much less to perform at the, Burrow, at the level Burrow did without any real threat of a run game. 34 of 56 was Burrow for 428 yards and four touchdowns. 108.3 quarterback rating. Add it to the list. Week 10, that's what, nine great Joe Burrow games? Uh, he, he's been amazing this year. If this team was anything but four and six, he'd be minus 1,000 to win MVP. The numbers he's putting up are absolutely nuts. He continues to do it. And the biggest number to me today, you said he was hit 11 times today, Craig. He was only sacked three times for a loss of seven yards. Those three sacks hurt, and they came at inopportune times, don't get me wrong. But the fact that that number three is so low when he was hit 11 times and that yardage loss number of seven is so low shows what he was able to do with his legs today, running to throw, running to extend plays, extending drives. Phenomenal work by Joe Burrow behind the line of scrimmage today to avoid pressure. It was in his face all night, and he was able to overcome it. The other player obviously having a career day, Jamar Chase, 11 catches, 264 yards, three touchdowns. This has his long as 70 yards, but you can't forget he also had a 67-yard touchdown. So a massive, massive day for Jamar Chase. 200 more yards in this game than he's had in any other game so far this year without T. Higgins. His previous high was 62 yards, 264 tonight. A great, great game from Jamar Chase. They were really the only Bengals that contributed significant amount statistically. Tanner Hudson had himself a day, though. Six catches, 42 yards, and one QB sneak to go along with his touchdown. Chase Brown, 13 carries, 42 yards, nine catches for 52 yards. He's added a ton in that receiving game, something a lot of people didn't expect from him as the Bengals starting running back this year. Mike Gusecki, just four catches for 30 yards. By far the worst game he's had without T. Higgins in the lineup so far today, or so far this season. Craig, those two guys, it, I, I feel like they're not getting enough credit because of the Bengals record, and obviously that's the case. You have to win games to get national publicity, and that's cer- certainly something the Bengals are looking at right now, but these two guys this season are putting up numbers that are, that are just otherworldly. Jamar Chase leads the league in yards and catches, or eight yards and touchdowns after a three-touchdown over 250-yard day would be floored if anyone catches him on Sunday. Joe Burrow is certainly near the top in yards now after another 400-yard performance, and I believe he's first in touchdowns. These guys are putting together a phenomenal season, and it's resulting in a 4-6 and record. I think that's why every loss hurts a little bit more, but, wow, we really do have two great ones in Cincinnati. Yeah, we really – I mean, I've been scrolling X, just marveling at all the different stats and and milestones that these two keep putting up. Yep. You know, Jamar Jamar Chase at this point. Um, I mean, the 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 company that he is keeping, the most sixty yard touchdown since twenty twenty one. 
Jamar Chase has 12 now. <laughs> Tyreek Hill has nine. Yeah. Nobody else has more than four. Right? So that's that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Jamar Chase, get this. First player in NFL history with multiple career games of 250 receiving yards and over two receiving touchdowns. First player in NFL history to do wow. it. Wow. Against the Ravens and Chiefs. <laughs> like, yep. Against yep. big, big, big time opponents. And he's him and Jerry Rice now are the only two players That's in NFL company. history, period, with 225 receiving yards and multiple receiving touchdowns um, in multiple games over the course of their of their career. I mean, they put a graphic the, up on the, the screen uh, at the end of this game that he was, I believe, the first player in the history of football to have 10 catches and 175 yards against the same team twice in one season. Yep. Unbelievable. Yep. And then, like you said, I think Joe Burrow's the, and I know there's a lot of other quarterbacks that Say get it. credit. I think Joe Burrow is the best scrambling quarterback passer yes. in the league. I, I realize that he's not the best scrambler. I realize that that Lamar Jackson and Patrick Mahomes and some of these other guys exist. I think Joe Burrow is the best pure passer when scrambling and he shows 100%. it every single week and you kind of mentioned it but he's the reason this offensive line isn't as glaring to many as they really should be yes. because they are atrocious but joe burrow makes so many ridiculous plays that put him in a situation where he basically saves the offensive line because of their inability to block with his legs and he's not the fastest guy he's not the quickest guy but he just has a feel and i felt like early on he had a little bit of happy legs and, and that happens but you know this is what we're seeing is is insane and i think we need to recognize it i think this front office needs to recognize it and put you know a team around him that can really compete for a super bowl I mean, Joe Burrow and Lamar Jackson this year in their two matchups, 115 for 170, 1,456 yards, 17 touchdowns, only one interception between the two of them. Joe Burrow in those games, 820 yards, nine touchdowns, one interception this year, and he's 0-2, Jacob. Yep. It it's the story of our lives. Story of our lives. But, hey, we – Here's the bright side, and I know that hit me. That I need we have, it. We have done this before. Is that you have a generational proven quarterback at this point? Yep. Hardest you thing have to get. The cornerstone of the NFL's successful teams. You can do this, Duke Tobin. I am talking to you. <laughs> the Bengals can do this. They can win a Super Bowl with Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow can take them to the promised land. Please extend Jamar Chase. Yeah. Give him an offensive line. Give him a defense that can hold teams to like 28 a game. They don't even have to be great. Just give them a decent defense and you can win a Super Bowl and all will be forgotten. I promise you, all will be forgotten, dude. Everything would be all right. Please <laughs> make it happen. Mike, give Duke the budget. Go sign some guys. Stop relying on the draft where you are terrible. Go sign some proven guys to help this defense. You had a chance this past offseason to sign a couple guys late in the offseason. You didn't do it. Guys like Calais Campbell, who yep. many thought that you should have traded for, was available in April after the draft. You could have gone and got him. I I think that there's a lot of young talent on this team that can get better and will get better. I, they are legitimately on the defense, like two pieces away, maybe three, from being good enough. Competent. You can very easily get there next year. Yes. You could have got there this year, if we're being honest. But you easily. can get there next easily. year. 
you can still compete for a for a playoff this this year you can compete for the super bowl next year the expectations that we were coming into this year with a number one seed a super bowl appearance maybe a super bowl win that doesn't change next year the expectations are exactly the same do your job go add a couple pieces and let's win a super bowl Absolutely, and it's going to be an uphill battle because you know every offseason in the NFL, you know you lose pieces as well. So those number of holes will certainly grow, and the Bengals will have to have to you know have remedies for all of that as well. Before we get out of here, Craig, while we're at our lowest, it's the most important to do the knee jerk reaction look aheads. It says win out on the J bar. I don't think that's necessary. We're sitting at four and six, 11 and six would probably get you in the conversation for winning the AFC North if you win out. I don't think the Bengals will win out. I think 11 wins would, would, would certainly be right there for division champion conversation. But I guess the first question, Joe Burrow said seven of nine after that Eagles loss. They've won one and lost one since then. So that would be six of the remaining seven. Are you on that same page? Do you think it's 10 wins to get you in, or do you think the Bengals could sneak in with nine depending on where those losses come? I think it depends on where the losses come. You've got you've got games still against the Chargers and the Broncos, and they seem to be your biggest competition at this point for yep. that last playoff spot. Those teams right now both sit at five wins. I'd have to look at their schedule. Let me let me just look. If I'm the Chargers, I've got one. Two Chargers have a tough schedule. Let me tell you, three, four wins left on the on the schedule, and then the game with the Bengals. So if they lose to the Bengals, that gives them nine wins. The other games, they still have to play the Ravens, they have to play the Chiefs, they have to play the Buccaneers, and they have to play the Broncos. So, like the Chargers have a somewhat difficult schedule yeah. still, and nine wins may get you ahead of them. The Broncos. They've got the Chiefs this weekend. Man, that Bronco schedule is light, brother. Incredibly. The the next the next uh four games for them, they play the Chiefs this week, but then they get Falcons, Raiders, Browns, Colts before ending the season with the Chargers, Bengals, and Chiefs. Yeah. I'm gonna go out on a limb here. Bo Nix has to crumble. Partly part Partly because I don't believe in Bo Nix. Partly because Justin Herbert hasn't shown me why I should believe in him. Fair. I think nine wins gets you in if you beat the Chargers and Broncos. I love right? that. Like I think that's that's a big piece here. You've got four wins right now. If you can beat the Chargers, Broncos, Titans, Browns, and one of the one of the games against the the Steelers. And maybe I think you've got it. And maybe the Steelers have the fifth seed in. locked up in week 18. Baltimore locks up the division. They're so distantly away from six and seven that they can't move. You're resting starters in week 18. If you're Pittsburgh, Bengals able to pick up a cheap win and sneak in as the seven seed. Something I've been circling really all season as we look at this uh, look at this schedule because uh, as we talk about this AFC wild card. It seems like a, and I, I, I'm not, I, I take it all back. I'm not just penciling the Ravens in as division champions. This Ravens team has a lot of holes. The Steelers are a very, very complete team. I'm not entirely sure that the Steelers can't win this division. We saw the Ravens lose to Jameis Winston Browns and Gardner Minshew Raiders. This team has holes and but can I, be taken think, advantage of. I think for the Bengals purposes, for what they need at this point, the best scenario is for the Ravens to win the division and for you know for them to handle their business yeah because at this point you've already lost both games to the ravens so like that is a is a wash i'm really at not even point, thinking about gotta, these two afc north teams though i, I feel like one of them is going to be the one or two seed and the other is going to be the five seed and it's over Like, I, I just don't know how one of these two teams falls down to sure. six or seven, I guess, is what I'm saying. So, I, I guess my argument for the Bengals is why does it matter what order they're in? I guess for week 18, if the Steelers rest their starters. Yeah, but either way, they have to be locked into whatever seed right. they're locked into, right? Whether right. that's the the Whether that's the two or that's the five. the division or the, the five. Exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. the Bengals. Um, the Bengals have really a matter, shot. But... They, they have that. That's that's the best part about this last I, segment. I think... After all these losses, is we find we find a path. I dread the day where we sit if, here. If we if don't the Ravens find can path. handle. Here's here's the here's the thing I'll say though, Jacob, is yeah. that the Ravens and Steelers still play two more times. They, okay. they haven't played yet this year. So if you have the Raven, the Ravens beat the Steelers twice. Oh my God! I can't believe I'm even saying this out loud. Oh, no. if, you, if the Ravens can beat the Steelers twice, the Bengals might have a chance to catch the Steelers in the standings because you play the Steelers twice as well. Twice yourself. You could be talking about four losses for the Steelers still this year, and that's not counting a game against the Eagles and the Chiefs still for the Steelers. So the Steelers could legitimately be looking at six more losses this year, and now you're looking at that shoot, you know, correct. ten and seven or nine, nine and eight range, and yeah. I don't know. Maybe maybe you can catch them. But who are we kidding? At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter if the Bengals no. can't figure things out on defense. But I I think from my perspective at this point, you've lost both to the Ravens. Hope that the Ravens hold serve against the Steelers in both of their games. And that next thing you know, the Ravens are – because the Steelers' schedule is rough. I mean, you've got yeah. the Commanders you got all this your weekend. divisional games still coming up. Ravens. You still have the Browns twice. You've got the Ravens twice. you got the Bengals twice. And you've got the Eagles and the Chiefs. Like, their, their remaining schedule is six games against the division, the Commanders, the Chiefs, and the Eagles. Like, that's – it's a gauntlet. Yeah. And – I know Russell Wilson looked good last week, but I don't know that I'm still sold on him being the Russell Wilson of old based on two games. So no. there's still hope. Doors cracked. That was a good little five minute therapy session, Craig. That helped that helped there's get me out hope, of the well Jacob. a little bit. I think there is hope. I think there is hope. I, the, but we're about we're about one we more have loss. This conversation. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. We have this conversation every week, every show basically. Yeah. And every show I want to be done. And every show I talk myself back into believing. I expect you to talk I'm me out of it I'm the pessimist one, and I talk myself into believing every time. I know. I know. Why is Everyone so else bad? is keeping like, us alive. Just me out of my misery, man. Yeah. Yeah, we're trying as – Bengals trying as hard as they can to eliminate themselves from contention, and, and the rest of the world just won't let it happen. Dragging us along. I dread the day because it's coming. It's coming. Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe the Bengals do win six of seven and, and make the playoffs. I'm dreading the day that this conversation comes and I flip the J bar to, to what does it take? And I, I send it over to you because I'm working on that playoff machine and, and I'm finding a way and I send it over to you and you just roll your eyes and send it back. That's going to, that's going to happen at some point, maybe this season, if we're lucky, maybe not, but I, I dread that. I thought tonight might've been the day that I asked you what it takes and you give me nothing, but it's not chatterbox Bengals. We live to fight another day. There's still hope in the 2024 season. The Bengals can claw out of this. We have a generational quarterback, a generational wide receiver, and we can build off that. This season certainly hasn't gone the way the Bengals and Bengals fans have all wanted it to go so far sitting at four and six, 10 weeks in, you can still get to the playoffs. You can still make a run. Once you get in the dance, no one knows what can happen, and I know no one wants to play Joe Burrow in the playoffs. This isn't a long-term place to be. Uh, the four and six, the, the sadness 10 weeks into the season, the giving up on the Super Bowl hopes and dreams. With about half the year left to play, this is not a permanent place. Craig talked about it there. There's only so many holes on this team to get back to a place of competency on one side of the ball, and with nine and one on offense, I have the utmost faith in the world in that side. So as the front office and coaching staff and everyone work through the next few off seasons to continue to build that defense up, hopefully the Bengals can get back to a point where we're talking about them as Super Bowl contenders and not battling with the Chargers and Broncos for the seven seed. But 10 weeks into 2024, that's exactly where we are. We're trying to find paths to the seven seed. And as of now, there are still a few. The window remains cracked open. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. It hasn't been turned off yet. Hopefully the Bengals can find a way to get their chargers next week. It's going to be another late one. I love doing these primetime shows with you guys. Chat keeps us going. Thank you to everyone who watched all day today. It's been a fun one, obviously until the end, but uh, it was Jacob, a fun stream. I don't know if we want to get into this night. It's, it's late. I realize that it's almost one o'clock on the East coast. What do you got? These post game comments. 
And again, I'm just reading these. Let's do it. Obviously not listening to them. Let's bring some uh, let Let's start here. Let's, let's start with Jamar Chase post game quote. I'd never expect in a million years that me and Joe would play this well. And we'd have this record. It comes down to the last few minutes. Every time he still has confidence that the make that the Bengals can play and make the playoffs. Joe Burrow said, this one's been frustrating. If you look at how me and Jamar are playing and how Trey is playing, it's a tough pill to swallow. Sure feels like two guys that are throwing a team under the bus and calling people out and telling them that they need to be playing better. Maybe that's what they need to do. Maybe going up there and saying this team's not a championship team when we all know we have a championship quarterback, maybe blowing smoke up the ass all these players doesn't work. Maybe you need your leaders to sit up there and say, hey, we're doing our job. We're performing at 100% top level week in and week out, at least for the most part. Jamar Chase has taken a couple games where he's been non-existent, but for the most part this year, I mean, he's the best receiver in football statistically, so I'm not going to hold that against him. These two guys are delivering. Trey leads the league in sacks. He's pacing uh, the freaking record, and, and, and you're unable to get wins. Yeah, good, good. I'm glad they said that because it's true. Yeah, it is true. I, are they saying it in the locker room too, though? I would. Uh, that, Don't love I, that, doing that, it in the media if you're point. not willing to do that's it. That's a fair point. Room. Now that is absolutely a fair point. It's the only with thing those I'll two say. guys, with those two guys, when I hear that, you have to think they've been saying it in the locker room for weeks. I don't know because Jamar Chase just came out and told me that he doesn't talk to Jermaine Burton. So, ah, uh, but I think Jamar Chase probably is walking around the locker room saying, "I'm doing my job, and you guys aren't." <laughs> That's probably true. <laughs> wouldn't doubt that at all. Not that he's talking to these guys one on one, but I, I, if he's saying that around the locker room, it wouldn't surprise me one bit. I mean, you're definitely yeah. right. I would like some more personal conversations amongst the best players on our teams with the rest of their teammates, but I, I, I wouldn't doubt that this had been delivered in the locker room and maybe a little less of a kind tone over the last few weeks. I, I wouldn't yeah. be shocked, but certainly a great point. Anytime a coach says anything to the media that they haven't said to the locker room, we tear them up for it. And it certainly applies to players and leaders as well. Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase, whether Jamar wants to be or not, he's a leader of this team and everything he says holds a little bit more weight than anyone else. So that's a, that's a big time one. And we'll get the, uh, the actual clips and, and see the tone and everything like that. And dive into that a little bit more on Tuesday. Yeah. Cam Taylor Britt, we've got to match the turnover battle. That's what wins games. I've got to go up and I've got to go get that ball. I think we all agree he had that interception that would have uh, changed things for sure. Uh, Wasn't able to come down with it. Zach Taylor on the third and two and fourth and two deep calls said that those are progressions. We'll take a one-on-one shot every time. Um, Yeah. I mean, some some interesting... uh, Post game comments that I'm sure we will yeah. um, go over on Tuesday. Uh, follow along on the Chatterbox Sports Twitter. Uh, they are retweeting a lot of these videos and sharing a lot of these videos. So um, Joe Burrow uh, on the missed calls on the final drive. We didn't talk about it, but Joe Burrow was uh, hitting the face mask on that two point conversion that wasn't called as well. Uh, quote I feel like I've never really gotten those calls, so I don't really expect that. That's interesting. Um, But yeah, so uh, long story short, uh, certainly some frustration seemingly uh, coming out. Um, Jamar Chase was asked if he was open on the Bengals two point conversion attempt and his response was, quote, yeah, I'm always open. That's (laughs) we know, Jamar, we know, we know, we know. Uh, And then just the the, you know, Zach Taylor asked about the two point conversion quote. We came here to win. Um, And then one final quote from Zach Taylor. Quote, it's frustrating because of the work we put in. We pour our hearts and souls into this thing. We have got a good football team, and our record just doesn't show that yet. There's still time. This team is going to hang in there and be there in the end. And like I just said, I haven't lost faith that that is the case. Mm-hmm. And Jacob, uh, everyone watching, you can still here. continue to tune in every week. For Chatterbox Bengals, Jacob and I will be right here for the ride as we battle our way back That's to the right. playoffs, Jacob. That's right. There's no one I'd rather fight this uphill fight with than, than Craig here to my, I guess that would be my left, and then the rest of this chat here with us. So uh, we appreciate everyone for watching. This was a tough one. This was a tough one. Uh, a lot of memories, a lot of plays in this game that I think probably would have went down in history if, uh, if the Bengals were able to pull this one out. And again, their loss to time 
as it seems like a lot of this Bengals season will be. Uh, uphill fight the rest of the way. Bengals are going to have to claw it out to get there. Craig and I will be back. We don't get to forget this game quite yet. Craig and I will be back on Tuesday night to break down the film, show you guys where it went wrong, talk about it a little bit more, really try to turn this page as we go into Sunday Night Football against the Chargers in L.A. this coming week. Thank you to everyone who tuned in. It was a tough one, and we appreciate you every step of the way. Who day until we die. That's how it works. Wins or losses, you bleed the orange and black. Thank you to everyone who watched. We'll catch you guys next time.